my grandmother, and um, basically I braided her hair uh, when she was sick. And uh, yeah, I, I knew then that uh, that was just important to me, uh, just to kind of utilize the skill that my mother has passed on uh, to help uh, bring in some light, if you will. You know? Uh, so, I focus on braids because I believe that it connects us all, actually. Uh, it's in all cultures. And, yeah, I really, really what my work is about, I really try to challenge the architectural aspect of what, you know, the braid can do. Uh, so I, I utilize some uh, references from like the Fulani tribe, uh, references from just like Catholic, um, just like this piece is called Bishop Please, you know? And she's kind of um, hanging from in those, like the models are also a big part of uh, how is it that the uh, sculptures kind of resonate um, just a little backstory, I guess, on the fashion process. Uh, usually the editor uh, asks, do you have a model in mind? And usually I like to work with models of color just because I think they are beautiful, of course, but are also underrepresented, underrepresented in the fashion industry. And, uh, of course, that has to be changing, so that's great. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to refer to some notes because that would help. All right. uh, while I look for notes, any questions that I could kind of... Yes. It's a great question. Um, actually, it doesn't. Uh, because Can you repeat the question? Sure. Thank you. See, that's that's what you want to do when you know how to do this. Okay. Um, basically, uh, what's your name? Sorry. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Joanna. Uh, she asked if the model's hair uh, length, if that had any issue with uh, basically putting on the sculptures, more or less. And the answer is no. Uh, a big part of my work is that the pieces are actually mobile. So uh, they operate as wigs and crowns simultaneously. And um, yeah, so that's a great question. The model's hair uh, has no effect. Um, usually, uh, if the model has um, like shorter hair, I may have to, um, yeah, just stitch, uh, just like in wig form, if anyone's familiar with like, just like weaving hair uh, extensions, it's pretty much the same process. Yes? Hi, um, the top right composition, could you just right tell us, yes, could you just tell us, it's fascinating, but could you just tell us about, you know, what, what, what you were doing there, the process, Sure. Sure. Um, Thank you. Um, one of the models' name. Her name is Gay McDonald, by the way. Um, she's an amazing woman. Uh, basically, the piece is called Butterfly Effect, and the idea behind it uh, was that in making these pieces, a lot of the times, like I would have references in mind, but. I definitely kept a big part of the decision making um, in a spiritual sense, as in like what is it that I felt was more a visceral of a decision as opposed to a referential one. And I felt like um, with this design, I didn't uh, sketch it out exactly. And this was the most free form I went and I felt like I was uh, literally following one piece after the other and had the image of almost like a butterfly's wing uh, flapping and 
what that effect would be. Uh, and, and this is pretty much what came about from that. Uh, this piece here, this piece here is called uh, Nefertiti Returns. And this was the most uh, traditional form of crown that I referenced for this piece. Uh, yeah, and I have actually a video um, that's online right now that pretty much uh, shares the actual physical process making of all of these pieces. Um, and she's actually in the video. Uh, it's called Reclaiming the Crown. If you guys YouTube that or uh, if you'd like, you can follow my Instagram account. I'll definitely post footage from there. Um, just from this talk, so that that would be nice for you guys to kind of reference back to. Um, so yeah, I, I have a bit of a question, guys. So redressing the crown, what comes to mind when you hear redressing the crown? Redressing the crown. What was that? Royal families. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of traditions here, but passing the crown, so it gets buffed and polished and reorganized and then handed it to the next. You said repolished, buffed, and handed over to the next? Reorganized, that's for different balls or things at different occasions. We have a lot of things in the crown. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm interested in this question because I think uh, redressing the crown does involve the idea of. Uh, kind of changing perceptions of, of how we're uh, just connected with, in specific to headwear. Like, uh, I mean, obviously hair is a big, big topic now, especially. Uh, and I feel like, um, yeah, I think it's, it's going to be here for a while. Uh, but when I came up with the term redressing the crown, it was really about uh, encouraging the idea of really taking the time to think about your surroundings, really taking the time to think about why is it that you have sort of perception of anyone when it comes to hair. Um, and even further, personally, as a woman of Haitian descent, uh, historically, the Haitian people were colonized by the French. So I kind of figured, as I did more research, that a lot of my aesthetics are uh, in line with uh, the French, you know? And I had to really think about if I was okay with that, you know? Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's a big concept, actually, as to, um, how I kind of hybridize uh, different cultures and ideas um, of ornamentation, what we choose to clothe our bodies with as well. If those link to uh, our historical past for the for the better or not, you know. Uh, yeah. Okay. So another question. Joe goes west. What do you guys? Yes. I didn't. Are you interested? I just turned 30, actually. Oh. Um, 11. Yeah. Um, at home, you know, uh, mom taught me how to braid hair. And eventually, I practiced on my Kenya doll. Knows, right? Um, and then from there, she asked me to braid her hair continuously, and uh, I was a little brat about it. But she definitely uh, is like my biggest influence as far as like, um, yeah, braiding a tight braid. <laughs> um, yeah. So this piece here, actually. Uh, is one that I'm working on, and um, it's a follow-up to a piece I just worked on for Solange in September last
times here. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar uh, with the British uh, publication Evening Standard. Anyone? Okay. Um, well, basically what happened, uh, I built a hair sculpture for uh, Solange where uh, she was going to grace the cover of their magazine. This is for the October issue. Unfortunately, the magazine uh, edited the halo crown that I built. And, uh, you know, basically that kind of um, offended. It kind of offended so much. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I was shocked, but I also wasn't surprised, you know? Sometimes I feel like, honestly, I may have some muscle memory of just like uh, being um, kind of underground and you know with uh, with my work. Usually there's uh, mask images um, with the headdresses, so I thought that was um, it was intentional. You know, I, I can say that. You know, it's not all like what was me, um, but. Yes. Um, what's the longest you Wow. Um, it's like the golden question. Right. Um, I mean, do you speak in like terms of days? Like you have to go back to a project and... Well, I actually have a term, like I, I like to use called chunk it. So like every 10 minutes, I just like work on one piece, I work on another piece, I work on another piece just because I feel like I can kind of challenge my decision making in those time frames and also um, try to re-channel, you know, we're all in social media, you know, and as a, an artist who works with braids and hand work, like I sew and stitch too, I'm like looking for ways to redirect my attention span or have the same attention span in a way that's So, um, thank you, that's a great question. But uh, to make these pieces, I can say it took about a month, you yeah, know, to do all four. Um, and usually, this was actually like project oriented. So if it's not project oriented, I can, you know, spend my own time in creating whatever it is that I like to. But I'm a Capricorn. I don't know if there are Capricorns in the house. Okay. Yes. I love it. Uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, kind of lost my train of thought there because Capricorns and Haitian. I was just like, wow. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I'm honestly like right now. It's it's really been. Um, I've never been this busy. So it's kind of a challenge to make, physically make the work that I want to do while uh, participating in the culture as far as working with different brands, working with different artists, because uh, those are desires that I have as well. But um, as we've kind of expressed here, like it does take time to uh, create these pieces and um, yeah I'm happy to say like this is definitely the time where I'm able to fully dedicate you know the artist's life and not like have a side job like retail you know My, <laughs> it's yeah it's very real yep. like um, I'm coming I went to FIT studied fashion design um, I've interned at Ralph Lauren uh, for their purple collection and Used to work at the Costume Institute at Fashion at Fashion Institute of Technology, so I was always mending like old garments, old gowns, um, really learning almost a cinematic um, setup for collection building. So this is um, these are two very important influences that I look to uh, yeah, further along express. So. Actually, this June, um, uh, there's a 
variety show that I worked on with director Terrence Nance um, called Random Acts of Flyness. Mm -hmm. And uh, you guys should check it out. You know? But basically I worked on a segment called Bad Hair. And um, you know, this I thought was a very powerful title uh, to use just because right now I feel like personally I'm in a place where I'm deconstructing my work, whereas at this time here, it was very much about structure, like building this inner structure and figuring out what it is that I enjoyed and what it is that I felt like was missing uh, as far as in my education, you know? Uh, having Haitian parents, the history isn't so much um, shared in the sense of um, trauma, but very much so in, um, you know, we have a lot to be a proud of. We were the first black republic in a new world. You know, we influenced the American uh, revolution, like inspired the slave revolt here, and you know. The darker aspect of that, I'm very much interested in that right now. So that's part of the deconstruction. So this year, I was like, well, I'm not completely finished with this piece, but I'm just gonna show it to you guys. So you can see like what happens before the finished product or what happens after battle, you know? Uh, a big part of using hair and braids is uh, building armature for, yeah, black women, I'm a black woman. Uh, building armature for women of color, and then in women in general. Uh, just because we have all different levels of what the hair game does, you know? If that makes sense. Uh, Yeah, okay, I'm gonna refer to the notes I said I would refer to earlier. But of course, any questions, very much welcome. Sure. Do you work by yourself? I do work by myself, mostly. But for Solange, honestly, I did have to get assistance, you know, um, a little backstory. It was just in the fashion uh, game. Everything happened so last minute, so. Uh, Exactly. Quick turnarounds. So uh, having assistance definitely was very helpful. Uh, sure. You said that you, in that phase, you were constructing, and now you're deconstructing. Right. What do you mean by deconstructing? Um, think, uh, deconstructing, what I mean by deconstructing, she asked, basically here I was saying I'm constructing. And now I'm saying I'm deconstructing. What's that about? Well, uh, I feel like uh, because in the past I haven't really been at the forefront of my work, uh, a lot has been uh, spoken of about my work, and I feel like that's a removal of my intellectual property in creating the work. So I feel like in a way I have to deconstruct it myself in order to reconstruct the ideas that I actually had in going to the work. So uh, it's also time, I feel like, I just turned 30. Okay. And um, I really want to investigate, uh, you know, the process more as opposed to the final product. Um, so yeah, almost leaving the product for you know, commercial things, if it's for television or performance. Yes? Um, I'm actually passing along a question from my friend who collects hair that has to do with who those people were. She collects hair from the artists. So, and she Who's was those here, people were? Uh, no, people. She, well, she collects, she, my friend here who asked me to ask the question, Hi. actually collect, collects hair from, from different poets and artists. And she, awesome. was, she was curious, where do you go for your hair? Real hair? Do you are you interested in the provenance of the hair? And I am too. Thank you. That's a great question. About to get really real. 
I do not use human hair. I don't. Uh, I use synthetic. And the reason why that is, one, for economic reasons, two, out of experience. I mean, uh, a big part of my philosophy is collaging items to reevaluate its value, you know, for, for the greater. So with these sculptures, I'm using, uh, again, synthetic hair that is much less costly than human hair and I think much spiritually, like, less invasive uh, to do that. I've seen enough Korean horror hair films to kind of freak me out with that. Um, but, uh, yeah, using synthetic hair is a big part uh, in, yeah, creating the structures. Um, I used to be in a collective uh, with Eric Mack um, and Tamashi Jackson uh, called Como Truvesa. The collective was a jewelry sculpture collective, and basically I would arrange found objects, found industrial objects, and create these ornate um, pieces with them, these one-of-a-kind pieces. The idea was to incite uh, conversation and uh, inquiry as to what this you know, um, seemingly beautiful arrangement was uh, that wasn't of diamonds or, you know, your precious gems that you're accustomed to. So I kind of used that I idea um, after we worked on an editorial together. I loved it so much uh, in creating these hair sculptures to match the jewelry, and that's kind of where things ran off with the sculptures, the hair sculptures. Thank you. That was core question. Yeah? Did you write your, your, your question there?